Hello, everyone, and welcome to week six of AI Ate My Homework. We hope you're enjoying the series so far and find the content inspiring. In the past weeks, we've broadly covered topics from molecular biology, drug development and AI, to really give you a holistic perspective of the field. As a reminder, next week will be our last session for the summer. If you missed any of the previous webinars, a link to the recording will be shared with you. As we explore the impact of AI to discovery drug discovery, today, our applied scientist, Dasha Redka, will be discussing about the interface of machine learning and drug discovery, as well as the work Cyclica is doing to combat COVID. Uh, thank you, Devesh, for the introduction. Hi, my name is Dasha. I'm an applied scientist here at Cyclica. Um, first, uh, before I get into the topic of discussion today, I wanted to introduce myself. Uh, I did my undergraduate degree in pharmacology at the University of Toronto. And even though that was quite a while ago, I still wanted to put this picture up here of some of the work I did in my undergrad, uh, because I think it had a great effect on where I ended up today. And I wanted to share my experience with you. So in my first year of undergrad at UFT, there was this girl in my class. She uh, asked me if I applied to these independent study projects um, that you could apply for. So I said, no, I don't know what this is all about. So she told me it would be good to apply. It looks good on your CV. I said, oh, okay, fine, I'll do it. So I went to the website where they had all this uh, information about independent study projects. And uh, most of the labs were offering one spot per student. And there was quite a short list of labs and there was a lot of students in the life sciences at UFT and everyone was applying to these programs. So I saw one lab from the department of chemistry that was offering 10 spots. And I thought, well, I'll apply. Maybe I'll have a higher chance of getting into this. And this was a uh, computational chemistry lab. So uh, I applied, I went for an interview, um, I came home and they told me they wouldn't offer me a spot. So I said, well, that's okay. Um, but what you're doing is very interesting. And if I can do some of this work, not for a course credit, um, let me know if you have the capacity to take someone on. So they replied, oh, we actually have a spot come in. And I am so grateful for that invitation because I ended up in this amazing inspirational environment where, so we had this professor Emiratus, um, this beautiful Hungarian name, Imre Gizmadia, who arranged this amazing, it was basically a course. He had these um, graduate students that were teaching us all, all, all we had to know about computational chemistry. Uh, professor Chismides himself, he taught us a course in computational chemistry, quantum mechanics. It was, it was quite amazing to be exposed to all of this in my, um, it was already a second year when I started uh, taking this. And so these students, they helped us set up the machines. I had this, you know, two partitions on my PC. All of a sudden, one of them was running Linux. I had these computations running for weeks. My Tiny computer was making, well, well, not tiny, this was early 2000s. Uh, it was making these airplane noises all the time. Uh, but, you know, uh, and I was going for weeks and I was sleeping fine through that. Today, of course, I have to sleep with earplugs. Anyway, the environment was so amazing. He gave us a chance to write papers, to participate in international conferences. So uh, I was so inspired. I'm so grateful for that experience because I think it definitely set me on a path where I am today. Just to give you one example of uh, what I was doing in my second year, uh, we were doing ab initio calculations to find the confirmations of these three molecules uh, methylamine acetone and molecule where the energy uh, would be the minimum. So it was kind of, it was, we were studying intermolecular interactions in this case. And the most exciting moment of the whole time, of my whole time there, and probably one of the most exciting moments in my uh, career, let's call it, uh, was figuring out this problem of negative bond angles that you had in the software of Gaussian 98 where if, if you have this, it's not really a bond because uh, like a regular bond is not a covalent bond, this is a hydrogen bond uh, and it's very mobile. So you end up kind of swinging from plane to plane and that causes an angle to go from positive to negative. And um, that makes the dihedrals that you use to define interaction of four atoms 
um, kind of mathematically meaningless. And um, the Gaussian 98 couldn't ha handle that problem at that time. And I, I, it probably can now, but it's been a while since I did this. So I introduced this dummy atom. And just by setting the um, parameters in the right way, I was able to describe the system without getting errors from Gaussian 98. And such a tiny little technical thing made me so excited that uh, I wanted to go and do research. And um, once again, <laughs> I wanted to point this out because this is what really inspired me to, to go and do what I'm doing today. And the lesson out of this is um, sometimes knock twice and do listen to those girls or boys in your classes that sometimes point you in, in some interesting directions in your life. So um, I did this for two years in my undergrad. And then um, uh, I was in the Department of Pharmacology and we had this great program where you could do uh, a summer job and you would get paid for doing a project. So I applied and I got a job there in the lab of James Wells. This was Faculty of Pharmacy, uh, but he was also affiliated with pharmacology. Uh, and later I got, uh, I started doing my PhD here as well because I liked it so much. Uh, in this lab, what I got to do w was take um, a sequence of a human protein, express it in insect cells um, using baculoviruses, and then we would purify the proteins using a, a, a series of you know, chromatography columns. And in the end, we would end up with purified preparations of proteins which we later would put into, say, a synthetic lipid membrane to imitate how the protein would behave potentially in a cell. And then with these preparations, we were doing radio ligand binding assays. Um, so we would vary the concentrations of different ligands that were labeled with, say, tritium, and then we would measure how much of that ligand would bind into the receptors and then we would be describing these binding patterns using uh, these mechanistic models that Dr. Wells was building in this very ancient uh, programming uh, language called Fortran. So I got to do a lot of basically hardcore biochemistry, pharmacology, and this was all very, very interesting to do. Uh, in the end of my PhD, uh, I thought, well, I've done molecules, I've done proteins, how about I go and try to do cells? So I did my postdoc in the lab of Dr. Sergio Greenstein um, at the Hospital for Sick Children, again, here in Toronto, where I got to do things like take my own blood. Well, I wouldn't take it myself. We had people in the lab that would do it. Um, not to say that I haven't seen people take their own blood. Uh, they would still ask us to pinch down some cubes for them, but it was quite interesting to see. Anywho, so we would take um, sometimes our own blood, sometimes somebody else's in the lab, and we would um, separate cells uh, in the blood, and then uh, we would separate red blood cells from um, the kinds of cell that you see here, which is a monocyte. And then we would take them and put them on plastic dishes, and then we would add some media, treat them with uh, endogenous cytokines for some chemicals, and we would make these cells do things, and then we would look at them on the microscope. Um, what you're looking at here uh, is a macrophage that has been transfected with a fluorescent protein. And that's why you see, you see white, but it's actually, well, white is the signal, but this particular protein was green. Um, and uh, that color is created by the microscope. So it was quite amazing stuff that where we could, I mean, this is literally came out of me and I put it on a dish and I put some protein in it. Uh, and I was able to visualize. And then I could do whatever experiments I wanted to do that were relating to neurological processes with the cell. So um, that was also quite exciting uh, stuff to do. And coming out of, out of my PhD, out of my postdoc and undergrad, uh, looking back at all that, I thought, well, uh, I think maybe uh, I like analyzing data slightly better than I like uh, doing the experiments, although I wasn't too bad at doing the experiments. It's just that I felt like the more exciting part of my day was I went, when I was at my computer playing with these models. And I thought, well, um, maybe that's what I should do uh, going forward. So I took um, a couple of programming courses, a data science course, uh, some machine learning courses. And that's one of the major reasons why I ended up here at Cyclica. 
and I don't, I don't get to do machine learning, but I do do get to do a lot of data science and data analysis, and, and that's quite exciting, and I'm having fun with it every day. So that is my background, and now I want to get into the topic of discussion today. Uh, which is what we can do for the current pandemic that we are in. You may have heard that we're currently in a pandemic. It's taken a quite substantial hit on, um, on our health uh, in, as a global and on our economy. So if we take, at, uh, if we take a look at the daily cases that we still have, uh, we are not really going down. We still have quite substantial amount of cases every day um, that pop up. Uh, this was taken, this image was taken on August 9th, so that was just a couple of days ago. In terms of the death rate, we're kind of, I guess, at a plateau, but things are not really changing. We still need to address this issue soon, otherwise we'll have to stay home for a while. First, before I start talking about what uh, AI uh, can do for this pandemic, uh, first I wanted to cover what viruses are, just so that we are all on the same uh, level, uh, starting point. Um, because I'm sure you've heard a lot about viruses in the last, uh, you know, few months um, in various sources or maybe in some of the courses you took in undergrad, but uh, I just wanted to do a quick review of the viruses. So what are viruses? They are essentially pieces of genetic material, RNA or DNA, that are wrapped in a protein capsid. And maybe there's also a lipid membrane around it. So this is uh, an example. This is kind of how our coronavirus looks like at the bottom here. It does have that membrane uh, envelope around it. And this is how a virus that only has the protein shell around it would look like. So um, DNA material, uh, or sorry, genetic material such as DNA and RNA are sort of the things that uh, will tell the virus and they also tell our cells what kind of proteins that they're going to transcribe and then proteins are these you know working horses that do all the work. Um, RNA is a more ancient genetic material but it's more unstable so that's why um, we don't use it to sort of maintain genetic information from cell to cell but viruses do because they have shorter uh, material and they're okay carrying that around. Uh, these viruses are neither alive nor are they not alive. Um, they are infectious obligate intracellular parasites, which means they have to be inside another cell in order to replicate. If you have a virus sitting on the subway uh, you know, handle, it is just a piece of um, genetic material and a protein at that point. But once it goes inside of you and it is able to get inside one of your cells, then it becomes alive and it's able to replicate and cause some harm. Um, so viruses kind of don't have, when, when we say like this virus intended to do this and that, they don't have, they're not alive really, uh, and they don't have brains, so we shouldn't give them properties as, as we give to other living things when we talk about them. These viruses uh, are the most diverse group of, um, I guess, things on Earth, uh, and we are all infected with viruses. They actually comprise some of the DNA material that we have, and we have some genes that actually uh, have been carrying viral DNA for uh, quite some time. And most viruses are actually not bad for us. And there is also a uh, speculation that maybe this viral, all these viruses that we have in us are as important as microbiome. You may have heard of this term microbiome, which is the collection of bacteria that you have in your gut. So the speculation is that the virome may be as important and maybe if we don't have the virome, our immune system may not be as good. So um, these viruses, as I said, are quite diverse. So they end up having quite different forms and shapes, as you can see on this slide here, and uh, they come in different sizes. So they uh, can be something so tiny as 30 nanometers, and I'll show you on the next slide what that looks like. And then can, they can go up to 1.5 microns in size, which is a size of a uh, bacteria. And they can contain either no protein, which is a very, very 
uh, virus out there that's infecting plants, uh, or they can have a lot of proteins that they code for. So this genetic material can be coding for up to 2,400 proteins. This is the biggest virus that we know. Or they could be something like, I don't know, 30 proteins. So there's a lot of variability in these uh, uh, viruses. So how does the size of a virus look in comparison to something that we know? So here is a, the diameter of a human hair. Here is a, how a relative, so this is also scale, this is a relative size of a human cell. And both, uh, both of these are kind of more on the smaller side of the average. Um, the average human hair is a bit thicker. Um, and then, so here's how a bacteria would look like. It's about, two, it's from one to five microns in size. Uh, and right here, this tiny dot is how a coronavirus would look like in comparison to human hair and all these other things. So the smallest virus we know would be about one third of that. So these things are quite tiny. That's why uh, when you're sneezing or talking, you should cover your mouth because they can travel quite fast, uh, sorry, quite far. So uh, what, when are these viruses alive? What is their life cycle? As I say, when they're sitting in a piece of plastic, they're not alive, they're just a piece of DNA and protein. Um, but then if they encounter a cell that allows them to enter and to replicate, in other words, the cell is susceptible, uh, then they become alive. So there are a few stages in this life cycle of a virus um, that it goes through. First, it has to find some way of getting into a cell, and we'll cover that in a bit. Once it gets into a cell, if it's still wrapped into some membrane that it acquired on the way in, it has to be able to escape from that vesicle, which is not really quite represented here. Then it has to make messenger RNA. And this is something that also happens with uh, our cells. Although we make our mRNA differently, we don't have RNA uh, to start with. We use D double stranded DNA to start with in our nucleus. Uh, but both viruses and us, we have to make mRNA, which later will be translated into proteins by ribosomes. And this is the, uh, the proteins, as Shelley described to you, are those worker proteins that do all the work and send all the messages around. In the case of, um, in the case of viruses, uh, they very often make this very long um, chain of the protein, and then they require special proteins to come in and cut that virus into pieces to make the final proteins that it's going to use. Uh, and we'll talk about this process and we'll see how it's important for the coronavirus in, in a bit. Another thing that the viruses need to do once they get inside, into, uh, inside of a host cell, they have to replicate their own DNA. And then in the end, uh, we have some RNA or DNA made and then um, that is put together with these proteins that the virus has made uh, and the viral particle is assembled and it goes out of the, of the cell. And this is called the viral cycle. So once it's released, then it becomes not alive again until it encounters another cell. So then why are viruses bad or some viruses are bad? So as you can see in this previous slide, there's a lot of things that are going on inside a host cell that is caused by the virus. Because viral, virus has to replicate inside a human cell, it uses up a lot of resources that the cell has. So it kind of takes, a, it takes over the cell function. And because of that, it end up cause, and ends up causing the cell death. So once the virus replicated, it can cause this damage to make the cell uh, either go through apoptosis or necrosis. Um, and it will inhibit the production of normal proteins that the cell would be busy uh, producing. Uh, and that, and that uh, also can cause leakage of enzymes from inside lysozymes, which are kind of the garbage collectors of the cell and they're degrading proteins that are unnecessary or recycle them. So, but that maybe is okay. Our immune system should be, or rather not our immune system, but we should be able to um, you know, regenerate those cells, it would be, uh, not as bad uh, if that was all the virus that was doing to us. The problem is that we also have the immune system responding to this viral infection. What the immune system wants to do, because it encounters this foreign 
uh, antigen, as we call it. So it's recognizing that the protein that is in the virus is foreign and it wants to defend against that virus. And that's a good response. That's what we want. So we'll have um, an immune uh, response uh, to the virus coming in where the macrophages will want to fight and present the antigen and then we'll have the adaptive immune response where we'll be producing antibodies in order to recognize this virus if we encounter it again. So that's a normal response but with some viruses such as coronavirus for example that can't be too much of a good thing. We can have something that we call immunopathology, where we have this over-exuberant innate and adaptive immune response. We have this dysregulated inflammation, <clears throat> excuse me, that's caused by macrophages and T cell being overactive. Um, and that causes something that we call a pro-inflammatory cytokine storm, and that leads up with into, into vascular leakage, increased the bacillus uh, cell deaths, and impaired uh, viral clearance. So, um, as in the case of coronavirus, all these things can be uh, bad and they're the ones that cause the majority of the disease. But of course, if you can interfere with the initial viral infection, uh, this wouldn't happen to that extent. So uh, what can we do and why haven't we done it yet for these viral infections, especially, uh, well, coronavirus specifically? Uh, typically how we can approach a viral infection is to have vaccinations, um, this is where we would expose our body to either a virus that is not active or cannot cause us harm, or we can introduce pieces of that virus, pieces of its protein, and then we can have the immune system uh, build up these uh, antibodies and to be able to recognize uh, when we actually encounter the infectious virus and get rid of it very quickly. And the problem is that developing a vaccine can take a while. Um, and all this time we're at home waiting for the vaccine to, um, to be produced. We do require that vaccine to be introduced before the viral infection happens. So people that are already uh, are sick, we wouldn't be able to help them. It's also very difficult to test a vaccine uh, because we can't really have a good, uh, it's, it's difficult to have a good animal model to test vaccines because the viral infection is very specific to the species. So we would only be able to test it in humans, but we can't really test it in humans that much. Um, so all these considerations, the safety and making sure that it actually works and not making us more sick, uh, th that's what makes the vaccine development so slow. And all of the vaccines or most of the vaccines that we use today have been around for decades and we know that they're safe and we know that they work. So we feel comfortable going and vaccinating ourselves and we all should do that. Uh, another way we can address uh, viral infection is having these small molecule antiviral drugs. And in, uh, we'll see how they work in a second. But developing these medications may take longer even then to develop a vaccine, um, depending how we do it, and we may not even be successful. Uh, you would also have to introduce this vaccine within, the, oh, sorry, not the vaccine, you would also have to introduce this drug within the first 24 to 48 hours of infections, because if you wait longer, the immune system will become active and you will have that inflammatory effect. Um, we can also try to address this, uh, this immune system over exuberant uh, activity by maybe using antibody therapy uh, or steroids. And very often this would involve immunosuppressing uh, our, our system. And that may lead to us having um, be, being more susceptible to infections. Um, and this is quite a complicated system here with immunosuppressants. I won't be talking about it today, although we are currently involved in some projects uh, that may involve some of the targets uh, for the immune system. What I want to concentrate on today is, is interfering with the viral cycle itself uh, through potentially developing antivirals. Uh, for coronavirus. Uh, there's this website you can visit that will tell you all that there is in development currently for coronavirus. Uh, it, uh, there are about 200 vaccines listed on this website. Um, I know that there are about uh, at least 70 antivirals that are in trials, but this count of treatments includes everything that there is uh, that is being tested for coronavirus, including things like antibody therapy. So check out that website if you're, website if you're interested. So how do antivirals 
work. Uh, so this life cycle of, um, of the virus that I showed to you previously, we can essentially try to understand the mechanism of how the virus gets in and goes through the cycle. And then we can try to interfere with every single step that the virus goes through. And interference, if this is an important step and we interfere in only one location, we by just going after that one um, process, we can interfere the whole replication cycle. And there are medications here that, can, uh, that exist out there that interfere with, for example, attachment of the virus, or they can interfere with the encoding of the virus, this process of escaping from this vesicle that the virus went in, and, or uh, interfering with the DNA replication all the way up to the release of the viral uh, particle into the, into the extracellular space. So there are a lot of options out here, a lot of mechanisms we could be interfering with if we knew what the mechanisms are and if we would be able to come up with a molecule to interfere with that process. Here, I wanted to show you an example of a, an infection of um, influenza to just give you an example of um, what a potential uh, points of the viral cycle that we could be interfering with. So for, here's influenza binding to our cell, and you see those little purple proteins, boom, it goes in. Uh, that's where it's binding um, to the membrane, and we can, for example, try to inhibit that protein and not let it bind. So here you have influenza coated in classroom, coated pit, pit, and that's a normal process. This is what happens every time a cell uh, takes in a particle, and then this classroom goes away from the vesicle, and that's a normal process. We probably don't want to interfere with that, but then right now you'll see something that does not normally happen. Boom, that, that vesicle bursts, and your virus comes into the cytosol. That is a very important mechanism that we can try to address when we're fighting against viruses because normally you don't have that bursting of that endosomes as we call them and um, the virus does something to open that up and we can utilize that to fight with the virus so this is one example of how the particle gets in and what uh, sorry uh, of how the particle gets in and what we can do um, i mentioned that you've seen influenza here binding to some molecule on the cell surface and this is one way that we can try to interfere. Uh, viruses of course are all very very different and they've uh, found, I, I use, I, I try to humanize the virus but that's not right. So some, let, let's say the viruses have different ways of getting uh, into the host cell. Uh, one way if the virus is very big it can go in through the process of phagocytosis. Uh, we call that eating so because it literally looks like it opened a mouse and took that particle in. There is also um, another process where we see this sort of open mouse behavior in the cells. We call that macropinocytosis and that we call drinking. So if the particle is small, sometimes the cell can kind of take in a, uh, a fluid from the extracellular surface and by doing that, it, it, it ended up taking in a few particles inside. And this is apparently how Ebola gets in um, and apparently has no receptor on the cell surface, but uh, macropanocytosis, as I found out in my postdoc, is actually, it does get regulated by binding to some protein. So uh, we won't talk about that, but I'll mention something else in a few seconds. And then, of course, when you get to this receptor-mediated endocytosis, which means that you have a protein that you're binding to on a cell surface, and then that uh, vesicle gets in in incorporated into the cell. And uh, the viruses were also creative here. Well, again, I'm humanizing the virus, I shouldn't. Um, we have a whole bunch of different proteins on our extracellular surface. So the viruses, different viruses, they bind to a whole bunch of different proteins. For example, here's our influenza, it recognizes sialic acid here, and that's how it gets in. And these other viruses listed here use other proteins. So when we're coming up with an antiviral that would address attachment to the cell surface, we would have to definitely consider what kind of receptor it uses to go in. And we have to know that information before we try to design a drug to interfere with this process. Uh, some viruses uh, are clever, again, I'm humanizing it, uh, they use multiple receptors and then it's very difficult to interfere with the attachment in that way. Um, so 
here is another example of a process that I mentioned on the previous page, macrophenocytosis, uh, which is not what coronavirus, uh, coronavirus uses, not to our knowledge. Um, but I wanted to share this with you because this is from my postdoc. Um, this is how e Ebola gets in, apparently. Um, what you're looking at here, as I said, was a macrophage. It's a pro-inflammatory macrophage where I've activated a protein called BRAC1 in the cell, and I made it drink. It wasn't drinking before, but I made it drink by it, it, activating this um, protein BRAC1. And if you look at this, okay, if you look at the square right here, you will see a membrane, and then you see it wrapped into a circle. If you keep looking at it right there, you'll see this process. But of course, this is, this is, this is kind of, uh, we can't rely on this movie to say whether or not this is actually a vesicle going in. So what we can do to confirm that, yes, we actually see fluids going into the cell um, in this particular case, we throw in some red dye into, uh, or rather molecules that are labeled with red dye um, into the fluid that is surrounding uh, a cell like this. This is a, a different cell, of course. Um, and then we let it sit there for a while um, we wash away the fluid and then we image the cell to see how many of those red molecules ended up inside the cell. And then there we can resolve those beautiful large macropenosome that went in. So um, apparently, you know, how I activated this RAC1 here, some viruses can actually do that. They can make the cell take them up. Um, and interfering with that is, is another mechanism that we can try to address. Here's a, a cell that it is typically drinking. So this is a anti-inflammatory macrophage that is uh, usually uh, drinking, depending on what phase of its life it is. But and this is a natural process. I didn't do anything to the cell and it's doing this, what we call ruffling. It looks like a ruffle of a, of a skirt. Um, and, and this is, uh, and it ends up uh, taking up some of those ruffles into these macropenosomes that go in. So it looks like there is a, a lot of potential for us to learn some biology, do some experiments and figure out the mechanism by which we can interfere with the viral replication. So why haven't we done it yet? Uh, and, and what is stopping us? So um, VJ talked to you guys about the process of drug development and how cumbersome it may be. So I just wanted to uh, quickly remind you about that process. Uh, but uh, so this is the process of how we typically develop medications. But in addition to how difficult it is to develop a typical medication with antivirals, there's addition, some additional uh, limitations that we have. Uh, first of all, we have to be able uh, to interfere with the viral cycle without damaging the host. And that may be difficult if the host proteins are the ones that are required for the viral cycle. Um, as I said, it's difficult to build an animal model and we can't really test on humans. So that's, that's a big limitation for viruses. And uh, when we inhibit that process, we have to make sure it's complete inhibition because we could uh, develop resistance to this virus. And that is not something we want to do. Typically in other therapeutics, uh, it's okay to inhibit to a certain degree, but in the case of viruses, we have to go for the kill. So then going back to this general process of drug development and why this um, could be difficult to do, well, first we have to identify the medical need and we do have it, we have a, a pandemic. Then what we need to do is identify the target, uh, meaning identify the protein that we can target in order to fight with this viral infection. And uh, we can try to figure that out by looking at some of the mechanisms that I showed to you in the previous slides. Um, another limitation here, we need to get a crystallographic or some other structure of this protein. Uh, and this is something VJ and David has talked to you guys about, uh, about the protein structures. Um, we get these by making crystals, solid crystals of proteins, and then we um, uh, shine uh, electrons on it and we get neutron uh, diffraction patterns and from which we can build the structure of the protein. So uh, once we know the target, then we can start coming up with molecules um, to uh, target that protein. And you can do that in a cell-based assay, uh, in an actual experiment, or you can try to do it by some simulations in a computer or, oh, 
excuse me, or some models that you have learned. Um, and this is what we call in silico screens. And this is where Cyclica can help because uh, we do do these screens in silico. Um, the problem is that before we do this step, we are rate limited by detection of the target and, and, and getting the structure of that protein. Uh, Cyclica can do something in trying to identify the target, but that involves having some additional information, such as what molecules um, produce this, uh, produce a certain effect uh, in these cells, and then we can work from the molecules. But in this case, in the case of coronavirus, all we have is that this thing is causing a disease and no other information. Um, is so, but let's say we can figure this out. We can find out what is the protein going to target. So like I can do its job. Uh, let's say we can come up with hits, uh, modify the drug, and then take it into clinical testing. And this right here, clinical testing, is a rate limiting step that happens uh, after we've developed a hit. And I want to cover that and address that issue because it relates to what we've tried to do uh, at this step right here. So this is a general problem with drug discovery. When we, once we come up with that molecule that does what we want it to do, we'll go through all of these phases of testing in the clinics. Uh, we'll test it on a small number of sub subjects and we'll increase the number of subjects. Uh, we'll test uh, uh, toxicity. We'll test whether or not it actually works in these different phases. Uh, and then we may get a government approval. And this whole process takes a long time. You see years on this x-axis. And of course, because of the how long this is and how vigorous it is, we will lose a lot of compounds that we have started with. So very few compounds will end up making it to the stage where they are approved for general use in the public. And this is quite a problem when we're faced with a pandemic and we are trying to come up with a, um, a drug very soon. If we look at how many approved drugs there are out there, it's about 2,000 of them. We do have some in clinical trials that hopefully, well, as, as you can see from this plot, not a lot of them will make it to the final stage. Uh, when I was an undergrad, they were telling, and that was a while ago, to be fair, but uh, there was a number thrown around for the number of approved drugs, like 400, and maybe they've you know, combined some mechanism, mechanisms in that uh, number, but still, that number is is quite small. It looks like we've uh, we've done much better since 20 years ago, um, but uh, that is still a very small amount of chemical matter to work with. Um, considering that we uh, we can explore uh, things like you know 10 to the power of 30 or something chemical chemical entities in uh, the uh, small molecule chemical space, and of course this all takes a lot of money to develop because it's taking so long and so many people are involved in this. So one may ask, if it takes so long to get to the approval, uh, why would anyone even try to come up a small molecule to try to address SARS-CoV-2 infection that we have right now? Do we really think we can get it to the approval stage in a very short notice? Or are we gonna sit at home for 10 years waiting for that solution to come along? So what can AI do to come up with a small molecule drug to address this? And what can Cyclica do specifically? What we have tried to do is exploit this um, the phenomenon that we call polypharmacology, which is that when we have, uh, oh, sorry, which is that uh, a molecule is uh, anticipated to interact um, or predicted to interact with something between 30 to 300 proteins in our body. That means that if we have this drug that we have approved and we know that this is particular, this, this one in green is its particular target that we're interested in, there's actually a good chance that when it goes inside our bodies, it will interact with way more molecules than just our target. And those would be off-target interactions. And they're potentially responsible for some of the side effects that we see with these drugs. So we thought, what if we use this to our advantage? What if we can 
exploit these off-target interactions. Uh, what if one of the targets that we are interested in for coronavirus is one of these off-target interactions from these approved medications that we already have? We basically want to use every possible, uh, every possible target that we can get out of this approved chemical matter. So how do we do it? We need to figure out um, we, we need to take these 2,000 drugs or 10,000 if we want to try to look at clinical trials, all of the clinical trials. Uh, and then we need to figure out which other proteins it binds to. And this is something Cyclica um, kind of can do. We do have a platform to predict drug target interactions, which we call Matchmaker. And what this uh, does is, first of all, we train this neural network, and Ali talked to you guys more about how we train neural networks. But what we do in this case, we collect all the information, or as much information as we can, from all of these databases that are out there that would report when a drug interacts with a particular protein. Uh, and there is quite a lot of these interactions reported out there, uh, something like 5 million interactions that we know of. And then what we do is we featureize a protein and convert it into some sort of numerical feature vector, or we can take, uh, we, or not or, we also take a ligand and featureize that. Then we build our neural network from this pair. And in the end, we are training the network. When we know that there is an interaction, we are telling the network that we know that there is an interaction. And then uh, once we build a network, we can use it to predict whether an unknown ligand can interact with, an, with a protein, with another protein. So then we, what we can do is we can take this database of approved drugs that we get from the database called Drug Bank. We can featureize those molecules out there. We can take all of the proteins that we know the structure of uh, from the human protein. We know the structures of, of about half of them. And we make sure to include whatever targets that we're interested in for coronavirus specifically. They can include some of the host proteins and uh, we can add some viral targets um, to, to the bunch here as well. And then what we do, we score how likely each of these proteins is to bind to each one of these molecules. And in the end, we come up with a list of top hits. Uh, we, for each single molecule, we have a list of proteins that are likely to interact with it in some, in some order. So then we can uh, look at that list, look at the targets that we consider to be statistically significant and explore that database that we call PolyfarmDB, which tells us you know, which molecules interact with which uh, proteins. So um, then, of course, um, as I mentioned, we need to know what host proteins and what host targets to go after in this, to, to explore in this polyform DB. So as I already mentioned, we can try to address the proteins that are viral, that are trans translated from the viral uh, DNA or RNA. Uh, or we can also try to target the proteins that are from us that are human, that are helping the virus to replicate, that the virus is using to replicate. And there are some uh, downsides to using uh, both of these. For example, with the viral proteins, uh, we need to know the structures of these targets. And if this is a novel virus, it will take some time for us to get the structure. Uh, we also need to know what those targets are, of course. And then, um, uh, and this is more of a technical thing here at Cyclica, we have trained our matchmaker currently only on the human targets. Um, hopefully we'll include more species soon. Uh, but that, that is something that we have to consider when we are applying it to human uh, viral targets because we haven't training, trained on the viral targets. So we have to make sure that Matchmaker is able to generalize into a different species. In terms of the human targets, uh, the limitation is, is that we have to know what the targets are. Uh, and we have to be able to inhibit their activity completely in order not to let the, the virus replicate. Um, if we look at all of the antivirals that are out there, there is about 100 of them out of those 2,000 drugs, uh, and we look at what targets they are uh, going after, we can see, oops, excuse me, we can see that most of the antivirals out there are going after the viral targets, uh, and only a small fraction is going after the host 
proteins. So um, in case, and it also of course depends on the virus, right? If the virus heavily relies on the host target to replicate, for example, it would happen for a virus that is very small and it doesn't have too many proteins of its own. Um, in that case, we would go after the host protein. If it's a big virus, however, and it has everything it needs to replicate, then we should probably go after the viral target. In case of corona, it has quite a, quite a good amount of protein, so we should probably go after both. It utilizes both the host and its own proteins to do things. So uh, I'll take you through the process of us selecting the viral targets. Late, uh, uh, this is late uh, January, um, about uh, a month and a half into the infection. We don't know much about the virus. Where do we start if we want to address this issue? The first thing we do is we go into Protein Data Bank, and this is, this is when Cyclica started to work on this around the end of um, January, and look for any viral, uh, viral protein uh, structures that are from SARS-CoV-2 that are in the Protein Data Bank that collects all of those crystallographic uh, data for all the proteins out there. I checked it there, we didn't have any structures, not surprising. The next thing you can do is you can try to look for the genome of the virus. And this was uh, amazing um, work by all the scientists out there. We've come up with the genome of the SARS-CoV quite fast. And this was great because we couldn't do anything without it. Once we know the genome, and you can go to these amazing databases like NCBI, which is also a great tool, um, uh, and you can do literature searches and uh, protein searches and genome searches. I highly recommend if you haven't used it to play with it. So this is where you can find the genome of the SARS-CoV-2. You can find all of the proteins that it is coding for. And uh, right now they're giving you this nice schematic that tells you, remember I told you it transla it's translated as a big polyprotein. Um, and this nice organization here will tell you uh, which are the pieces of that polyprotein. This is very good information to have. They didn't have it right away. And then what you do is, uh, oh yeah, and then they give you a list of all the proteins that are in SARS-CoV-2 and you can go into each and see the sequence of each protein. The next thing that you do is you can take that sequence that you got from NCBI, you can try to blast it against all of the proteins that are recorded in this uh, protein data bank. And you can find proteins that are similar enough um, to your uh, virus of interest uh, so that you could build something that we call a homology model and we do this using this um, another amazing tool uh, called uh, Swiss model um, and here we can build a 3D structure of the protein using the structures that are out there for similar proteins. So in this way when we did all that we found two proteins that we could target. It's called the uh, 3CL protease, and here they show you the location of the protein and that big polyprotein that is translated. And there is a spike protein. The spike protein is the, the protein that gives uh, coronavirus basically its name. It, it, it is the thing that's making all these spikes on the virus. And this is the protein that the virus uses to attach to the viral membrane right here. And it also uh, uses, um, uses the human protein ACE2 um, to go into the cell. This is where the spike protein attaches. So right away, we already have one of the human targets that we can go after. Spike protein is also involved in helping the virus get out of this endosomal membrane. Uh, so this is another uh, important role that we can try to address when we're coming up with the antiviral. Uh, this protein, the 3CL protease, our other target, is involved in cutting this big polyprotein into the small pieces uh, in order to form the final proteins uh, that we need to put the virus back together. So this is the most important protease in the, it's called the main protease in the, in the coronavirus. So that's another important target that we can go after. So uh, we've used, uh, we built the, the models for these two proteins, uh, the 3CL as well as spike. And in case of the spike uh, protein, we uh, had this crystal structure that we were working with uh, for the SARS-CoV-1, uh, where spike was bound to the ACE2 protein, its receptor. So then we can target the interaction between these two proteins to try to interfere with it. And this is the side uh, of the interaction that we're going for. We try to address it both, both from the perspective of spike 
and from the perspective of ACE2. So that is for the viral proteins. For the human proteins, again, this is late January, we don't have any experimental data about what proteins are involved in the viral replication. So uh, what I did, I went into um, NCBI to look at PubMed to find any literature uh, about the proteins that are involved in SARS-CoV and, and MERS-CoV infections. And uh, so these are very, very related to SARS-CoV-2. Of course, they have big differences. So we, don't, we didn't expect um, all of these proteins to be involved in SARS-CoV-2, but what we came up with is this list of potential human targets for SARS-CoV-2. And we did this in the hopes that soon uh, experimental data will find um, one or two of these proteins to be involved in SARS-CoV-2 specifically. And, uh, you know, and at that point, we would have the information available for anyone to, to go and try to test these predictions. And uh, it, it turned out that our you know, expectation was correct. There was a paper that came out, I believe it was in March, um, that found that TMPRSS2 that we had here in our list and Casepsin uh, B as well as L1 and 2 were involved in um, SARS-CoV-2 infections. And this is where those two um, proteases work. They cleave uh, this spike protein in order to make it uh, able to escape or cause sort of the, the opening of this vesicle and, and have the virus escaped into the cytoplasm. So these are quite important um, proteases. And it uh, turned out that it's actually not enough to inhibit one or the other. You have to go after both of them. And uh, potentially, you would be using two medications to do that. But another thing we can do as matchmaker is try to go after two targets at the same time, exploring this uh, polypharmacological concept. And we did uh, find some molecules that were able or predicted to bind to both TMPRSS2 and Casepsin B. Um, and one of these examples is shown here. It's uh, disopyridine. Uh, we are showing it here docked into the TMPRS and Casepsin B proteins. Um, uh, the disopyridine is shown in green. Uh, and the reference molecule that was originally there in the crystal structure is shown in gray. So we made all of these molecules available uh, in this publication that we um, made available online. And um, so this is only one approach that we can do this. There is also holistic ways of finding human targets, which I won't talk about, but you can look at protein-protein interactions like in this paper here and uh, come up with targets in that way. Um, and uh, these are going to be my final remarks. I'm sorry, I'm running. Uh, I, I think I, I, it took me a while to get through that. I'm sorry. Um, but what I wanted to say in the end is that uh, our a artificial intelligence, which is supposed to be represented by this uh, scary robot here, cannot really do much without all of the wonderful experimentalists out there uh, that are doing all the hard work coming up with these targets. And we cannot do anything with all these tools that are out there that are collecting um, protein structure information, that are collecting all the literature, and, the, and they're building tools for us um, to be able to build structures of proteins from all those proteins, for example, using a Swiss model. So I'd like to thank in the end, uh, sorry, I'd like to say in the end that uh, I, I, I was really, really impressed with the world, how everyone came together to fight coronavirus. And uh, this is amazing. And hopefully if we all work together, we can try to speed up this pipeline to produce that uh, drug for coronavirus um, very quickly. Thank you very much for your attention. I just wanted to leave the slide up here. If you're interested in taking some courses, if you're a programmer, you can try to uh, take this course on virology. It's really great. It's on YouTube. Um, by take, I mean, you just watch it. You don't have to do the exams. And if you're a biologist interested in programming, I recommend you take a couple of, or th this particular course uh, offered by MIT, which I found very, very useful. All right, that would be all. And if you have any questions, oh, I see the questions on the side here. Let me just pull this up. Okay, let's see. What challenges do you face to receive access to the data from various resources? Must be different considering 
patient privacy. Right, so we don't really use patient data. All the data that we do use is publicly available and there are licenses for every database that is out there. So if we don't have, um, and, and a lot of these databases are, um, uh, they have a license where you can use it uh, for academic research and sometimes even for commercial research. Some databases you can purchase. So if you're uh, commercial like us uh, and you can purchase some of these databases. We don't really use patient uh, data. We use um, the data that's collected in experiments. Um, uh, so, but if we were to use patient data, we would, uh, pro we, we would have to make sure that we uh, get all the permissions required for that, yeah. Um, to train matchmaker, consider you, yeah, the quality of data. So we rely on the quality of the data that is submitted um, to these databases. And uh, I'd like to make this point again, we are extremely reliant on these databases. So um, we cannot do anything without it. We can only teach this robot uh, what we know if we wanted to predict something. Uh, and we cannot, we cannot do it without um, previous knowledge. Um, do you think? Do you think it would be possible to make a drug from a combination of pre-existing drugs uh, to interfere with multiple target processes during COVID infection? Yes, and I think there are some, um, uh, there are some to make a, uh, do you think, to make a drug? So do you mean combining uh, two medications? Uh, if, if you use two medications at the same time, that is definitely possible and people are doing it. There are some trials, there are a lot of trials that are using combinations of drugs. If you put two molecules together, if you've used them and then try to address it, that, that it will have to go through all the, the whole process again. Um, but if you want to clarify this question uh, and ask again, if I haven't answered it, please, please let me know. Uh, would there still need a clinical trial to evaluate the effective dose of the pre -exist? Yes, yes. So this is a very, very good question. There will still need to be uh, clinical trials to make sure that the dose is effective. Um, however, if uh, the drug is already approved, that process is slightly faster. And I don't know the, the details of that, so uh, I wouldn't answer that more specifically than that. Devesh, there is a question here that you would like to answer live. Well, those are the questions uh, that are on. Ah, yeah. Screen. Okay. Okay. Great. Are there any more questions? Let me check the chat. Devesh, do you see anything in the chat? I think that's all the questions for now. I'll give a few minutes if anyone else has a question. Um, but overall, Dash, I really like sort of the points that you highlight where, you know, it's all these pieces kind of working together to really accelerate drug discovery. Like AI has sort of gained a lot of recognition in the recent years, um, but you know, it's definitely built off the work that all the experimentalists and the scientists were collecting that data and really, you know, vetting it scientifically that allow us to do the work that we do. That's right, that's right. I'm glad you pointed that out again. I think it's a very, very uh, important concept. We can help with discovery, but we, we need our experimentalists for sure. Unless we can teach robots to do work and then we need experimentalists to do the brain work. <laughs> All right, I don't think we're receiving too many more questions. Uh, I think if no one has any more questions, you know, we'll wrap up here. Uh, thank you all for attending this week, uh, this week's AI My Homework. Last week will be our final week for the summer. So, you know, we hope you tune in and join us for the last session. And All right, thank you everyone. <laughs>